Greetings. My name is Michael Miner, and I am the National Director of the National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated, Hope Health Ministry. On behalf of our convention president, Dr. Jerry Young, and the chair of our federal faith-based initiative, Dr. Alvin Love, I welcome you to our Health Ministry Training Module 1, Health Ambassador, Lesson 2, Part 1. It's my privilege to serve as your facilitator for the second part of Lesson 2 of our Module 1 Training Series. We hope that you'll go to our website HopeNBC.com and learn more about the work that your Hope Health Ministry is conducting. Also, you can find out information about our 10-year celebration. That's right. September 2020 will mark 10 years of the National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated Hope Health Ministry. We certainly thank God for this decade of service to our denomination. Now we come to our focal scripture, Psalm 139 and 14. I know some may ask, why don't we select a different scripture for each session? But if we look at the words of the psalmist and think about our bodies, think about how we are tripartite, mind, body, and spirit, and so many things about us, we don't do anything at all and it just happened. Our heart beats, we don't have to tell it to beat. Our lungs breathe, we don't have to tell them to breathe. Our mind, even when we are asleep, is still working and controlling the functions of our bodies so that we can stay alive. So, when we read, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, we can only thank God for us part of his blessed creation. Now, let's go to our pre-session checklist. Let's begin as we pray for God's guidance. Lord God, we come to you thanking you for your goodness, thanking you for your grace, thanking you for your mercy, thanking you for this health ministry training. We ask you, Lord, to open up our minds that we will receive what we're about to hear. Then, Lord, help open up our hearts that we may be able to be the health ambassadors to do the work of ministry, mind, body, and spirit in the National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated, congregations, and the communities we serve all across this nation. And, Lord, we thank you that we're wonderfully and fearfully made. We ask it now and call it done. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you hadn't already, please go and download the COAS study guide. If it's unavailable, you can email info at hopenbc.com and we'll be more than happy to email you a copy. Finally, review the training guide. Now let's review the session flow. We'll begin with an overview of the Hope Health Ministry training modules. Next, we'll walk through the lesson, Lesson 2, Part 2, Module 1 of our Hope Health Ministry training manual, Health Ambassador. Finally, as we've done in the previous sessions, we'll take a moment to share about the All of Us Research Program, an ongoing initiative of the National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated, Hope Health Ministry. We remind all of us that we are a part of something that says, the future of health begins with you. Our National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated, Hope Health Ministry Training consists of three modules. Module one, that's the module in which you are participating now. 
is our Certified Health Ministry Ambassador. In this module, you learn the nooks and bolts of starting a health ministry and the connection between faith and health. In the next module, Certified Health Ministry Promoter, you'll learn about activities that you may conduct in a health ministry, both in your congregation and in the community in which your church resides. And finally, the third module is Congregational Health Leader. After you have an opportunity to work as an ambassador and a promoter, then you'll learn ways of becoming a health advocate and finding resources to sustain your health ministry. Your NBC USA Hope Health Ministry Training Team has been all across the country conducting training. In the top left-hand corner, you see a training session that we conducted in Hernando, Mississippi. In the bottom left-hand corner, it's another training session that we conducted in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we certainly, especially in this time of virtual uh, sessions, would like to arrange an opportunity for health ambassador training for your association, state convention, or group of churches. All right, let's take a moment to review from lesson one, part one. We begin answering the question, what is congregational health ministry? As we walk through each word, congregational health ministry, we developed the following comprehensive definition of this phrase. Congregational health ministry is a holistic approach following the concept of Shalom to health that builds on the strengths of both the congregation, that's the assembly of believers, and the community built in the missional church movement. It emphasizes wellness, health promotion, and disease prevention that's being proactive, not reactive. It encompasses congregational and community resources and partnerships and focuses on body, mind, and spirit, trinity wellness, for the health and healing of the community. That is the definition of congregational health ministry. Now that we have formally defined congregational health ministry, let us now continue answering the question, what is congregational health ministry? You know, each one of our levels of training has different designations, health ambassador, health promoter, congregational health leader. But hadn't you found it funny that no matter whether you are an ambassador, a promoter, or a congregational health leader, we continue to refer to you as a health ambassador. Isn't that something? Why is that? Well, let's take an opportunity to provide a formal definition of health ambassador and discover why this name has become the name for all of you all that are participants in our National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated Hope Health Ministry. As we mentioned briefly in Lesson 1, Part 1, your Hope Health Ministry team made numerous trips to the Partnership Center at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. During these visits, we shared about our work. One aspect of our ministry kept coming up over and over again, and that was our Health Ambassador Ministry. They were pleased that we would develop a cadre, a network of trained health promoters across the country. And in their minds, they saw our health ambassadors as their quote unquote, national guard of health ministry. What would that mean? Well, that would mean when the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services had a particular health initiative, they had to get the word out across the country. 
they knew they could contact the National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated Hope Health Ministry team and we would get the word out. Over the years, we have acted as their National Guard in the promotion of the Affordable Care Act, in efforts surrounding uh, the flu shot, and now as we work with them on the All of Us research program. But this still doesn't get us to a formal definition of health ambassador. It explains why we are called health ambassadors, simply because this is the name that our friends at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services identify our volunteers all across the country. To begin the search for a definition of health ambassador, we have to go back to where it all began. Back in the spring of 1997, Pastor Bernard Montgomery and myself met to talk about revitalizing a regional usher federation. We thought about the our times of seeing the ushers on Sunday mornings. In particular, we talked about the Red Cross usher, the lady who, in addition to her usher uniform, had on a nurse's cap with a Red Cross on it. And we'd see them in action most often if somebody got happy and they fell out. Well, of course, we know the routine. They would take off a shoe and wave it off their, under their nose. From maybe the Red Cross usher, maybe the person with the bottle of aspirin or the peppermint. We know that these really weren't nurses. And some of the things that they did, we were just blessed that they didn't create more harm than good. But really, it was the closest that we had to health ministry in the church. So when we finally revitalized this usher federation, we decided to make health a centerpiece of our efforts. Well, at the time when we started this effort, we had many of our colleagues and others who began calling us the health nuts. I thought that was interesting. Well, the reason they called Pastor Montgomery and I the health nuts is because it's kind of like an oxymoron for black Baptist preachers promoting health. After all, are we the ones that are really pushing fried chicken, cake, and really, really sweet tea. But we persevered and realized that we were going to make a difference in the health, not only of our congregations, but in our, through our Usher Federation, in the communities in which we serve. We continued that work and discovered more information, more resources to help us in our health ministry training. We were fortunate to make connections with several groups that were conducting training called parish nurse training in the area. We saw that it as an opportunity to provide another level of training for our ushers. No, they weren't nurses. No, they weren't going to become nurses. We looked at this training and recognized that the vast majority of the training had nothing to do with being a registered nurse, but had everything to do with faith and healing. So we work with them to develop this ministry that was geared toward nurses in a way that had a session or sessions for laypersons. So we had to look at the origins of the nursing profession. And in our research, we discovered that the nursing profession does have a biblical basis. That biblical basis is Romans 16 and 1. In that scripture, Paul said, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deaconess of the church, as centuria. And so the Greek word here is been, depending on your translation, translated as deaconess. Other places has it as servant. Now, we're not referring to deaconess 
as in a lady deacon, but more akin to what we know in our churches as a mother's board. And from this particular effort, the work of this uh, Saint Phoebe, as we see this pictorial, the deaconess ministry, service of God, it was about service. In particular, women in the service of the early church. Through the centuries, the work of the deaconess ministry continued informally throughout the early Christian church. During the second century, the work of the deaconess became more formal. Eventually, an aspect of it transformed into the nurses ministry. In the 19th century, we see to the far left on this slide, Florence Nightingale became the mother of professional nursing during the Crimean War in Europe. In the next picture from your left, we see Clara Barton, who founded the Red Cross, some would call the mother of nursing in America. In the next slide, we see Sojourner Truth, who worked as a nurse during the Civil War. And finally, Mary Eliza Mahoney, she was the first black registered nurse. And so we see here the early history of professional nursing. And as we see, and up until recently, was primarily dominated by women. And so we find the roots of our training and the work that we do in the founding growth and the professionalism of nurses. Although the nursing profession found its root in the church, over time there was a disconnect between nursing and its faith origins. It wasn't until the 1980s when a Lutheran pastor named Dr. Granger Westberg decided to reinvigorate this connection. In so doing, he became the father of the parish or faith community nurse movement. In this effort, we found that the connection was remade between nursing and faith. As a consequence of this effort, they developed a formal definition for parish or faith nurses. Yes, we know they are licensed registered nurses, but they practice holistic health. And the whole efforts are done to do what's highlighted in our slide, to maintain and or regain wholeness in body, mind, and spirit. Our National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated Hope Health Ministry is built upon two pillars. We've already explored one. That is the parish or faith community nursing tradition. We saw how we came to our Trinity Wellness component where we learned how to maintain and or regain wholeness in body, mind, and spirit. A second area from which we develop the Hope Health Ambassador is the community health worker model. According to the Rural Health Information Hub, a community health worker title is an umbrella term. And you all, it describes a lot of different work by a lot of different people, but essentially, it describes public health or social service workers who are close to and serve members of the community by helping them to adopt healthy behaviors. They are people in the community helping folks in the community as they all work together toward establishing a culture of health. 
Usually they share the same ethnicity, language, social economic status, values, and life experiences in the communities in which they serve. So based upon the range of work conducted, we see why various definitions exist for a community health worker. They may also go by different names. They might may be promotores for Hispanic brothers and sisters, community health representatives, or community health advisors. Some community health workers conduct invasive activities, such as checking blood glucose levels. At the other end of the spectrum, community health workers simply provide health promotion and education. Well, that's where our NBC USA Health Ambassadors fall into this second category. We are health promoters and educators. We're not involved in any type of invasive activity in the work that we, in the ministry that we do. And above all, community is at the center of what we do. A community health worker is a frontline public health worker, a trusted member or the community, or maybe they have a close understanding of the community by virtue of being a part of the congregation in that community. This trust relationship is important. Why? It enables the community health worker, in our case, the health ambassador, to serve as a critical liaison, link, intermediary between health and social services and the community at large. And when we do this, we facilitate access to services and provide the quality and cultural competence of service delivery. One example of being a frontline public health worker has been the work that many of our health ambassadors have done in support of the Affordable Care Act. Since the Affordable Care Act first opened enrollment period in the fall of 2013, thousands of Americans have received information and some even have been helped to enroll by National Baptist Convention USA Hope Health Ambassadors, as they have made a link between people in that congregation and in the community in which they serve who did not have health coverage to this federal program that provided them the needed coverage. We also recognize that by being on the front line, our National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated Health Health Ambassadors are literally a bullhorn in the communities, bringing awareness about different issues around health and awareness. So really, at the center of all that we do as health ambassadors is a community. And that community is a both and. The community that is in the congregation in which we are part and in the community in which our physical church buildings reside. What else do community health workers, what else do health ambassadors do? Well, we see some things here from this pictorial talking about connecting people, especially this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. While a number of our health ambassadors are working with their churches or other community groups with food pantry uh, deliveries or pickups. As we get more and more people in our communities that speak languages other than English, how we can have bilingual services. Some of our churches, even in this pandemic, are still providing uh, their church vans for transportation. Of course, abiding by local ordinances and others dealing with safety during this pandemic. We've already talked about the connection with health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. And some are even doing things with housing as we are making sure that people have quality, affordable housing. Some of our health ministries are providing the wraparound services that are needed once people who have been on public assistance are finally become homeowners. And also this housing, this wraparound assistance is involved with people who may be in uh, assisted housing, assisted living for our seasoned saints as well. So there's so many things that the health ambassadors can do in their work in the community. We want to take one last look at the fact of bridging the gap. The Minnesota Community Health Work Alliance developed this pictorial 
that talks about how community health workers, and in our case, health ambassadors, bridge the gap between communities and health and social service systems. You see in the middle, the community health worker, health ambassadors. On one side are the communities, and the other side, the health and social service systems. So at the bottom, you see how this connection works. The first thing, build individual and community capacity. And we look at that because many people could do better when it comes to their health. It's all about having the right information or the right encouragement to make better choices. Sometimes it's getting a personal job because in many cases in America, if you want good insurance, health insurance, you'll need to have it through your employer. A second area is being an advocate for individual and community needs. Sometimes people either just don't know where to go or sometimes they don't have a loud enough voice. It's not about being radical or protesting down the street with signs. Sometimes it's simply making a phone call or sending an email and said in such a way that the person receiving it has no other alternative but to act quickly on the behalf of the person in need. A third area, promote wellness by providing culturally appropriate health information to clients and providers. One of the things I've learned in my seven years as serving as the executive director of Get Covered Mississippi is that we had to prepare all of our material at the middle school level. Not because we're trying to put our material uh, uh, being demeaning to people, but just a recognition about the level of reading comprehension. And other things, we have worked with several organizations that have prepared collateral material to distribute in our community. And it never ceased to amaze me the number of times they want to send something out that yes, it has a person of color on it, but the way that person is depicted is not something that we want to share in our communities. So it's important that as we work as health ambassadors, that we keep in mind who we are and who we represent. And finally, assist in navigating the health and human services system. You know, it's a lot more difficult than it was years ago. A lot of people could readily go to the yellow pages. Remember those days? Find a phone number. And they'll get on the, on the phone and talk to a person. Now, there are no yellow pages. You have to go online. A lot of about seasoned saints are used to the old way and have difficulty trying to connect with those services that they need. We have to work with them and find the right numbers, sometimes making the calls for them and navigating through the menu, menu, menu options before they finally get a real person. Another aspect of it is that sometimes people just get frustrated. They get tired. They just want to give up. As health ambassadors, you can be that person that can help them, encourage them, or maybe take the baton and continue on so they are connected with the health and human services that they need. At the end of the day, we recognize that many that we work with, are, as they always say, are not looking for a handout, but they're simply looking for a hand up. Health Ministry and Evidence-Based Research in Lesson 1, Part 1, we learned about health disparities. One of the goals of our health ministry work is the elimination of health disparities and promotion of health equity. Well, how can we eliminate health disparities if we don't know what they are? So it's vitally important for our health ambassadors to understand and participate in evidence-based research. That's one of the reasons that we are a participant and promoting in the All of Us Research Program that's working toward mobilizing one million or more people in the largest research effort of its kind in the history of this nation. It's important for us not just to be the ones that the researchers come to, but we need to be some of the researchers. We're pleased to have researchers as a part of our team. We also need to be part of the publications in the research arena. 
And we need to have, just as it been in other things, a for us, by us attitude so that we can be involved in the crafting on how this research takes place. So at the end of the day, in efforts, including the one now, as we're working toward finding a vaccine to combat the COVID-19 virus, that we are at the table. After all, we realize that if we're not at the table, when major decisions are made, we're going to be on the menu. In 2012, the editors of Childhood Obesity Journal, in preparation for an issue celebrating the second anniversary of former First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative, asked me to discuss how our convention was integrating evidence-based research into our health ministry work. We provide an excerpt of this article in the accompanying study guide. We also provide the reference information so that you're able to Google and read the article in its entirety. But in summary, I shared that the basics of what we were doing was all about our health ambassadors using our congregational health and wellness survey, which you see displayed on this slide. Over a couple of months, our health ministry team went back and forth on what should be included and in the format of a sufficient congregational health and wellness survey. We decided that it could only be one page and only on the front because very few people are going to take the time to flip it over and complete what's on the back. And what our thought process was that as we use this survey in our congregation, it will give us a snapshot of the health and wellness of our folks in our congregations. And we wouldn't just stop there, that once we did it at a certain point in time, then six months, a year later, we'd do it again. So over time, we would find longitudinally what has been the progress? Are the people getting healthier? Are they getting sicker? And so the thought was that if we could do this in churches all across the country, that this will give us an opportunity to find out more about what makes us healthy, what makes us sick. After reading that article, and about other activities that your National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated Hope Health Ministry had been doing, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of a Minority Health approached us about conducting a pilot. We talked about different states. They decided they wanted us to do a pilot in the state of Alabama to find out the efficacy of using health ambassadors in congregations and communities to promote healthier living. This initiative was called Turn the Beat Around. And the focus was all about stroke prevention. We're thankful that the president of the state convention at that time, Dr. Vernon Swift, opened up the doors of the state and help facilitate the cooperation of the pastors and the moderators and the wing presidents so that we were able to conduct training in Mobile, Montgomery, Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, and Huntsville. During this period that began in 2014 through 2015, we were able to train health ambassadors in the churches and then deploy them, providing a curriculum that helped them and the members of the congregations to determine how they can make better choices. These better choices will end up 
giving them an opportunity to have a better quality of life, lowering their risk of stroke. This was, in theory, what we expected. But in reality, what actually happened? Well, we weren't surprised at the outcome. Yes, our health ambassadors, our trained health ambassadors, their intervention in working with the members of their congregations and others in these cities, it made a difference. Their numbers were better. Their risk of stroke was greatly reduced. It was validation of what we had been saying for the first couple of years of our work. Our health ambassadors, which are built upon the parish nurse and community health worker models as health educators and health promoters. No, we're not involved in invasive activities, but our messaging, our examples make a difference in the health outcomes of those in which we serve in our congregations and in the communities in which we live, work, play, and pray. We're also were excited that this effort was so good, it was so well received, that it was published in the Public Health Nursing Journal, a peer-reviewed journal in 2015. You see here the front page of that journal article. We include it in our accompanying study guide the information for you to look at the complete article. We're also pleased that your National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated had people who were competent enough to be able to publish an article that is now been referred to, uh, cite, uh, citations used, reference, a part of the discussion about African Americans and health. And this was all because of the work of health ambassadors. Praise the Lord. We spent most of today's lesson talking about health ambassadors, the origins, the definition, some of the things about the work of the health ambassador. But at the end of the day, health ambassadors are individuals just like you and me. So we felt it was important for us to say a few words about the connection between faith and wellness from a personal basis. In the accompanying study guide, uh, Betty Franklin, a faith community nurse, offers her perspective in answering this question. She began her essay with this quote from Richard DeVos. The only thing that stands between a man and what he wants from life it's often merely the will to try it and the faith to believe that it's possible. As you can see from the pictures on this slide, and talking about faith, the author said a simpler explanation states that belief believes that an egg yolk would turn into a chicken. Faith is putting that egg into an incubator and trusting that it will hatch. Belief is believing a seed will turn to a flower. Faith is planting the seed, watering it, and knowing you will have a beautiful flower. Belief draws a map. Faith is about action. It inspires us to start and move forward. Real faith takes us in the direction of our goals and purpose. So faith has everything to do with wellness. As you ponder what you've learned from this training session, we pose this question. What are some of the things that shape your conviction about health? In the Economy Study Guide, we have some blank lines there for you to jot some notes down and for you to reflect on it and think about your take on the connection between faith and wellness. We submit to you, faith is nothing more than what this picture on this slide says is when you see this glass with water,
Do you think it's half full or half empty? If you a person that lacks the faith, you see it as half empty. But if you're the person that has the faith, as they say, the size of a mustard seed, you see it as being half full. It's the same picture. It's all about your perspective, the lens by which you perceive it. Now we pause to say a few words about one of our initiatives. It's the All of Us Research Program. The National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated through our Hope Health Ministry has been collaborating with the National Institutes of Health in this effort. It is part of the Precision Medicine Initiative launched by former President Barack Obama just before the end of his second term. What this initiative is all about is enrolling one million or more individual it's with special emphasis on diversity for people of color and people with uh, physical challenges, people from rural areas, people that don't normally participate in these type of studies and put it all together so we can find out not necessarily what makes people sick, but what makes people well. I am proud to have been enrolled in it and been pleased to be a participant. You see a picture of me after my initial enrollment. And as the other picture on the top left hand corner says, and we hope that you will become a part, the future of health begins with you. If you'd like to find out more about this initiative, go to our website, hopenbc.com, and click on the All of Us Research link, or just email info at hopenbc.com. Wow, it's been about 45 minutes again. Certainly hope that you have enjoyed this lesson. It has been a pleasure for us to prepare both the study guide and this video. If you have any questions or comments, please take a moment now to type them in the chat area. If you simply forget to do it, that's all right. You can email us at info at hopenbc.com. We're here to do what we can to answer your questions. If we're not able to answer the questions, guess what? We're able to connect you with the appropriate resource. So again, feel free to type in the chat or email us at info at hopenbc.com. Well, you're now ready for the next step. And the next step is lesson three, module one. And for better or for worse, that'll be the last lesson in this series on Digiversity. If you are interested in additional lessons, please let us know by emailing us at info at hopenbc.com. Oh yes, please don't forget to complete the training survey. Some of you already have the link or you have uh, participated in the previous courses. We know it was like a for a one-time opportunity. So as you take another session, please, or complete another survey, but adjust your answers accordingly. Let us know that you have completed previous surveys. Now, you're going to receive a certificate uh, from the National Baptist Congress. However, we need you to complete the survey if you want to receive a training certificate so that you can be entered into our database as a certified health ambassador. And also, once you receive your certificate of training, you'll be eligible to continue on and go through all three modules of our training and participate in our continuing education courses that provide additional training in other areas of health education and promotion. So this concludes our Hope Health Ministry Training Manual Module 1, Health Ambassador Lesson 2, Part 2. God bless you. God keep you and enjoy the rest of the day.